unto him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Be blessing and honor, glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I hope this day finds you abiding in the love of God and that his gracious hand is upon you. We're glad for those who are able to come back into the assembly, grateful for those who can watch at home. I'm going to say hello to Jim Hicks. Uh, I know he wishes he could be here with us. And uh, now that I've done that, I suppose I'm going to have to each week say hello to somebody who's still at home. And then if I leave someone out, I'll offend someone. Never mind, I'm not saying hello to Jim. Jim, I take that back this morning. Hi, Mom, I can do that. She's up in uh, western New York. Now, we're, we're especially blessed this weekend because the daughter is here, our oldest Jessica and Jacob are here with the grandkids, and um, it worked out really well because I needed something for my mantle in my home office, so I plopped them up there, but I just wanted to tell you while I was, t they climbed up there without me knowing, so and before I spanked them, I said, I want to take a picture of that, it's pretty funny. So while I was trying to take a picture behind me, the sliding glass doors, we have um, all, all the lizards. Are, are at our house. They're in our yard right now. I know you don't have any because they're all at our house. And Easton was wanting to catch a lizard all weekend. And so we kept going outside when we'd see them skirting all around here and there and climbing on the walls while I have sliding glass doors in my office. And behind me, a lizard jumped up onto the glass. And so while I was trying to take their picture, they got all excited. Oh, there's one! Um, and then I finally got all, all three of them up there. Now, just quickly, because this involves grandchildren information too, but Bluebell, it's important you understand, they have for a limited time only a new flavor, fudge brownie decadence. Anyone had it? All right, the rest of you need to repent and get to the store. Natalie, we've had it. And last night, um, Linky, every time I'd try to get little Lincoln to give me a spoon, we were playing this little game where he would pull the spoon uh, away from me. And Natalie, Natalie, do you see yourself in that picture there? Yeah, she was bombing it there. That's a bomb level expert there on that. But we were enjoying that, um, that bluebell, and it is decadent and it's only around for a while so we might have to uh, borrow some freezer space from some of you so we can keep as much of it on hand as possible. All right that was just a little fun before we get uh, into the lesson. Here's, here's a sobering question, thought-provoking, at, at least it is to me. If Jesus was going to say something about you and assess your character in one statement, what, what would he say? If you were to approach him, Jesus saw you coming, and he said, Ah, here's Tyler. He's a Christian who is... Ah, here comes Jeff. Behold, it's Jeff who is... Because there's a time in the Bible when someone approaches Jesus, and he does that. And he makes an announcement of his character and it's quite striking and it really makes me wonder well if there was something by which Jesus could sum up my character if he were to say something like that I wonder what it would be and I, I hope maybe some of you know where I'm going with this as we continue our series face to face with Jesus and we're going to look at one that I hope will be quite informative and edifying for you this morning but you remember we looked already at the the leper and then the uh, rich young ruler who came to Jesus and then last time John the Baptist but now I want you to go to John chapter 1 and look at the encounter between Jesus and Nathaniel and really the whole a uh, series of events that takes place surrounding Jesus and Nathaniel. So we'll look at a number of things we learn from this. And I want to call the lesson by the appellation that Jesus gave to Nathaniel, an Israelite indeed. So 
underneath face to face with Jesus for our note takers make sure to write that at the top of the page I want you to at least see it visualize it like you see it here an Israelite indeed that's what Jesus said to him well let's see how all of that happened now four points I wanted to take what we see here and break it down into starting in John 1 43 turn your Bibles there but I'll have all the text uh, that we're looking at on the slides but uh, I, I want to break it down in terms of the encounters between the individuals here so four four basic points here number one let's look at Philip and Jesus and when we look at Philip and Jesus we're, we're gonna see something here just a brief thought, just a quick comment here about the nature of discipleship. Well, here's what I mean. So in John chapter 1, as we come to verse 43, after John's magnificent prologue, after that profound opening to his gospel, he tells us how John, God used John the Baptist to identify Jesus and to point him out as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then John tells us how Jesus begins to call his disciples to himself. And so he calls, well, and, and, and actually the way that he ends up calling the first couple of disciples is when Andrew approaches Jesus and asks, where are you staying? And he says, well, come and see. Come and see. And Andrew went and got his brother Simon he went and got Peter, his brother, and then now we read what happened after that. So the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. Now, Philip's one of the apostles. He will be one of the apostles, and this is how he becomes one of those uh, of Jesus' 12. And he said, uh, the text says, he found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Now, I just like that terse statement, just Jesus saying those, those two words, Follow me. That's what discipleship means. To be a disciple is to be a learner, a follower, an imitator. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ means we are striving to follow the example of the Lord, the teaching of the Lord. And that's what the Christian life is about. We don't often speak of it, it seems to me, in the church in that way. A lot of times we talk about how you need to become a Christian and you need to be a faithful Christian in order to go to heaven we don't often as often say you need to become a disciple of Christ and we need to be faithful disciples if we want to be with the Lord forever but that is essentially what the Christian life is about that it's uh, it, it's not just a matter of getting baptized it's not just coming to church it's following Jesus in every thought, in every word, in every deed, in every single day. We're trying to reproduce in our lives the, the life of the Lord. And we know we fall, we fall so far short of that, but yet that's what we're striving to do. So that when others see us, they would see what Christ would say in that situation. They would see what Jesus would do in that situation they, see, they would see how Jesus would be as a husband or wife as a son or daughter in, in whatever relationship this is what Jesus calls to every single one of us listen Tyler follow me that's why I made you that's what you're here for be my disciple follow me that's that's a great two-word summary of what our lives are about and so I just wanted to highlight that briefly now second then we see something here between Philip and Nathaniel so Philip and Jesus but now Philip and Nathaniel because the text goes on to say and there are two points here here's a under this so I didn't want us to get confusified so we've got a and B here we see a model of evangelism we often appeal to these verses when we talk about discipling people when we talk about making others disciples of Christ because here we read as we continue in the text verses 44 and 45 now Philip was from Bethsaida the city of Andrew and Peter that that we read about them just before this and when the when Andrew wanted to go follow Jesus he went and first got his brother Simon, Simon Peter. So he's telling you now, Philip's from that same city. 
and he did the same thing. So Andrew went and got Peter, and Philip, when Jesus said, Philip, come and follow me, he went and got someone else. He, he found Nathaniel. And in the list of apostles, we'll come back to this at the end of the lesson, Philip and Nathaniel, in three of the four lists of, of apostles, Philip is listed closely with another disciple named Bartholomew, and we think that this is uh, Nathaniel. So he went and found Nathaniel. And he said to him, and I love this here. Now, think, those of you who did, were not raised in the church. I, I was not raised in, in the church like many of you were, like my wife was. And those of you who weren't, and maybe you were in a denominational body, and maybe you thought you were a Christian, and then someone sat you down and you studied the Bible more, and you learned the way of truth, and you received it, and you remember do you remember the feeling? Do you remember how excited you were? There's, there's this same kind of excitement, I think, in Philip as he comes to Nathaniel and he said, we found him. We found him. For generations and generations, the people of Israel, as the centuries rolled by, they've been waiting for the Christ, for the anointed one to come. And so imagine thinking about your people living and dying for millennia, more than a millennium. And then one day, your friend comes up to you and says, he's here, I've, we found him, him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So it seems there's some excitement there. He found the truth. And so he was excited to share that with someone else. Now, as a new Christian, I remember doing that all the time until, you know, I was doing it with strangers that I met, and I was doing it with family members and friends. Hey, I found something. I found the church you read about in the Bible. I found the right way to be saved. A man w talked to me about my soul and we sat down and opened the Bible and I saw these scriptures and I want to show you these verses in the Bible. But then, you know what happened slowly over time after being rejected virtually every time I tried to talk to someone like that, then I, then I noticed I, I got sort of like everybody else was in the church and I didn't talk about it that much anymore and didn't have that same urgency and that same excitement and that same drive and that same joy of discovery that would compel me to to want to speak out maybe looking at this can help ignite that in us again I think we need constant encouragement and I know we become more mature we we get wiser in the way that we look for opportunities to talk to people but I just love this that uh, we we can have gospel meetings and we can have public assemblies and we can Hope that people will come to seminars that we have and maybe learn about us through advertising and maybe literature that we pass out and hope that they come in, in some public setting and hear the word of God and receive it and be saved. And years ago, the church grew tremendously like that, two weeks long gospel meetings and people would pour in and people would respond and get baptized throughout the gospel meeting and then there would be follow-up studies a new christian class and all of that well that isn't really how people are converted today is it it's it's more like this when andrew goes and gets his brother and philip goes and gets his friend and says we found the, the truth. We found what the Word of God says. I want you to know about it. So we see a model for discipleship there that challenges us, and I hope it does you like it does me this morning. It's really made me think. But we see something here as well about overcoming prejudice. Now, here's a, here's a well-known statement. It's almost proverbial now in the way that Nathaniel replies to him because you remember in in the previous text here he says that we found him it's Jesus of Nazareth Jesus of Nazareth so what happens when Nathaniel hears this what is his response wait Nathaniel said to him can and he doesn't just say well can the Messiah come out of Nazareth Nazareth isn't even mentioned in the Old Testament you said you found him that uh, whom Moses was writing about, that the prophets were writing about. Well, they don't say anything about a town named Nazareth, not explicitly. So 
He, but, he, but he doesn't just say, uh, can the Messiah come from Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Th- that's, a, that's a prejudice, isn't it, about that location? Now, when I moved down here, I thought of this statement a lot. When I moved down here from New York, and I was a Yankee in Texas, and people would ask me, well, where are you from? They could tell I wasn't from these parts, you know, um, the way I talked back then especially, until being in the South for a long time sort of knocked the, uh, at least much of the uh, edge off my accent that we had back in western New York. Um, people say, well, you're not from around here. Where are you from? New York. <laughs> well, people think, well, can anything good come out of New York. I remember people joking about that. Kim's daddy always called me the Yankee. That was the way he mainly addressed me with a bit of a contemptuous tone, you know, to it when he'd say it. But we, we have these notions that we form about people when they're from this place or that place. And it's just interesting to me that he, he just looks at Nazareth with this, with this condescension like what what is Nazareth that's just an obscure little village it's nothing nobody comes from Nazareth nothing good can come out of Nazareth so he has his uh, a prejudice he has already an assumption he has a conception in his mind that I shouldn't really expect this to be true I shouldn't really expect that he's found the Messiah if he's saying this Jesus guy is from Nazareth. Now, what's Philip's response? How do you deal with that? Well, I love the way Philip responds. What does he say? Well, come and see. He doesn't say, well, take my word for it. Uh, he says, now, you, you investigate it for yourself. Come and see. And, and to his credit, he does. And That's the kind of good and honest heart we need to have to to seek truth. You know, people might have some prejudices about Christianity, what they conceive of as Christianity, and maybe especially about the church, about the churches of Christ maybe. Have you ever tried to talk to someone about the church and like, oh, those people, the church of Christ, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I know about the church of Christ. Or maybe they know someone in the church who was a terrible person and they formed an opinion about all of us based on that of course which is wrong to do but I know a lot of times that's something we if we're not careful can easily slip into we can form opinions based on very limited information and a lot of times people may have these uh, conceptions and, and what we want them to do is we'll investigate it don't take my word for it. You know, I've come to know who Christ is, and, and Christ has changed my life, and I found his church that you read about in the Bible. I found the way of salvation, the kingdom of God. But don't, don't take my word for it. Let's just open the Bible and see. Let's go to the word of God and see. Just be willing, be open, be willing to consider Be willing to question your assumptions. But that's not just something that we want others to do. We have to be willing to do that as well. I mean, what about even in the church when we hear about something maybe we didn't hear growing up in whatever congregation we belong to? And then maybe you hear a preacher or you hear something that isn't exactly what you've always heard. And a lot of times there's like, well, in fact, I I know someone who was recently asking me something about had to do with um, paradise in Hades and, and that issue about where are the dead. And so she said, you know, our preacher here at this Church of Christ, she said, he was, he was saying this and that and the other about that. And I said, okay, let, let me explain to you what, a little more what he was trying to say. And here's his position. And I showed her all the scriptures. And every time, I mean, several times in the conversation, she just said, what, I, but I've just never heard that before. Oh, well, but just I, I, that's not how I've always heard it. I just never heard it. Like there was this reluctance. There's this sort of skepticism because if it's not what I always heard, see, because I, I already know all the truth, <laughs> right? So you can't tell me anything. I already know everything I need to know and I know I'm right about everything. 
That's how, so, that's how things go in social media, right? <laughs> There's not a, a lot of real open consideration and uh, productive debate and conversation that goes on in social media because a lot of times it's like well you don't know what you're talking about I know what I'm talking about and and there's not an openness to consider what others have to say but we need to be willing to do that as well in in the church to evaluate our own beliefs to be willing to investigate to have this kind of openness in this honesty so we learn I think there's something here to be learned about overcoming those prejudices or questioning those assumptions and making sure and and the only way to make sure the only way to know is to be willing to evaluate willing to investigate there's a lot more we could say about that we got two more points though and we're at 21 minutes so let's go let's go Tyler number three Jesus and Nathaniel now now we get to our face to face Jesus and Nathaniel. Two points again, A and B. Notice we learned something here about the knowledge of Jesus. And what I mean by this is not knowledge about Jesus, not knowledge that we have of Jesus, but knowledge that Jesus has of us. Because the text, as you continue, verse 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him. This is what I opened with a few moments ago. And he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Now, there's possibly some irony in what Jesus said here. But notice the idea of he, he's not just an Israelite. He is truly, truly one of God's people. It's, you know, in another place, Paul would say, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. So, in other words, just because they belong to the people of God doesn't mean they really are living as the faithful people of God. And so you might be an Israelite, and you might be able to say, yes, I'm a descendant of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. I belong to the, the chosen people. I'm a part of the promised people. I'm in the covenant. But are you an Israelite indeed? And he says, in whom there's no deceit. The irony may be, the people of Israel named after Jacob and Jacob was a deceiver you remember he was notorious for his deception of his father he took advantage of his brother to buy his brother's birthright and then later he stole the blessing by playing the deceiver making his father think he was his brother and so Isaac gave the blessing to him and here he's saying now here's here's someone a descendant of Jacob and there is no deceit in him Jesus is praising him for his integrity and his character now this is fascinating because Jesus has never met him he's never met Jesus how does he know and that's exactly what Nathaniel, Nathaniel said you don't know me <laughs> that's the way the way we'd say it today you, what uh, how, do, how do you know me how do you know anything about me and Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, ah, oh, there may be some significance to that that we don't have time to look into. But when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I saw you. Now, this, if we can be a little crude in our terminology, this blows Nathaniel's mind. But notice he said, I, I saw you. Even though you weren't here in my presence, I saw you. That really got me to thinking, this idea. I, I saw you. That Jesus sees us and that he knows all about us. Now, when Christ was in the flesh, his knowledge was limited. And there was a limitation of the exercise of his divine attributes. And there were times he was surprised. And he would express surprise. There were times he would say, I did, there's something he didn't know, like the time of his return in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. He said, well, even the Son of Man doesn't know the time of his return. But Jesus had supernatural insight. And he knew about others. But I thought about this. Think, I hope this would be an encouragement to you. Let me say it this way. You know, when, when you were struggling and you felt like nobody saw and nobody cared, Jesus could say, I saw you, and I knew. 
or maybe you did something kind and you went out of your way to do something good and it wasn't appreciated and you felt like someone, no one took notice of it. Jesus could say, I saw you. See, the knowledge of Jesus of us is both a matter of comfort in situations like that, but it's also a matter of concern. Because he could say as well, when you were up late the other night on the internet and nobody was watching and you were looking at things you shouldn't have, I saw you. And when you were dressing down that person and you thought nobody else was going to know about it, but I, I saw you be unkind and I saw the hostility or I saw when you thought no one else was looking, I saw you. It's a matter of comfort and concern. If we just go back, or rather go, whoops, I'm hung. If you could press the space bar, um, Jerry, for me, and it should wake up. Is anyone, it, is anyone awake in the tower? It's up in the tower. There we go. Thank you. Um, in just the next chapter, we're told, John 2, 23 through 25, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them. Ah, he was still careful because he knew all people and he needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. We're told a friend is someone who knows all about you but loves you anyway. And I think that's a good way to think of Jesus. He's someone who knows absolutely everything about you but loves you anyway. But that should be a motivation to me. It should be both a comfort and a concern to know that Jesus sees me and Jesus knows me. Well, let's move on. We learned something here about the identity of Jesus. We might have to make this a part one, part two. I don't want to wear you out this morning. Notice in verse 49, then, this is how Nathaniel reacts. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Now, that seems like quite a jump. How do you go from a man being able to know you were under the fig tree when you thought no one else saw you, and this man you never met, saw Philip come to you, saw Philip call you. How do you jump from that to say, well, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Notice the titles we get. The Christological titles here in this opening of John are just incredible. But back in verse 40, when Andrew goes to get Peter, he says, we found the Messiah. Remember, that means the anointed one. Those whom God had chosen would be anointed. Oil would be poured over their heads. That was an anointing. Or the priest whom he selected would have water uh, sprinkled on him. That was an anointing. That anointing, now notice, that's what Messiah means. But remember here, Philip said he's the one Moses and the prophets wrote about. And then here, Nathaniel himself says he's the son of God. He's the king of Israel. Well, where might he have got this idea he's the son of God? Well, just earlier when John was pointing out Jesus as the lamb of God, he said, I bear witness that he is the son of God. And it may be that Nathaniel sees, ah, this is our, our Messiah, and our Messiah is God's Son because you have Old Testament passages that speak of the Messiah in those terms. Psalm 2, 2 Samuel 7, 14. Notice in Psalm 2, we'll just look at this one, how uh, in this particular psalm there's this idea the nations are raging against God why do the nations rage verse 1 and the people's plot in vain notice the kings of the earth verse 2 they set themselves and the ruler the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his there it is Messiah the anointed and the Greek word is Christ but God says you know he who sits in the heavens laughs and he holds them in derision and he says as for me I have said doesn't matter how the nations are raging and how they're setting themselves against me I've set my king notice the Messiah is the Lord's king I've set my king on Zion my holy hill and then the uh, son or the Messiah is speaking and he says the Lord said to me you are my son Today I have begotten you. That's quoted in Acts 13, 33, Hebrews 1, 5, and Hebrews 5, 5, and applied to Jesus Christ. 
that that's God saying that of Jesus Christ. And so what is he? He's the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He's the king. He is the son of God. All of those things we confess, we acknowledge. If you are a Christian, that is what you must believe about the identity of Jesus Christ. Well, let's get to this last point. And I'll, I'll rush through this. I don't want to keep you, but it is fascinating here. Jesus and Jacob. Jesus and Jacob. Notice, basically, Jesus says, now here's how I'm going to word it. Read, read the text first. Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? <laughs> That's nothing. You're going to see greater things than these. And the slang way that we would say that is you ain't seen nothing yet. You're going to see greater things than these. So we might think, ah, now Jesus is going to say, you're going to see me make the lame walk and the deaf hear. I'm going to restore sight to the blind. I'm going to cleanse lepers. You're going to see me raise people from the dead. Oh, you're going to see some marvelous, wonderful things. That's not what he says. He says, truly, truly. Now, this is a way Jesus emphasizes what he wants to say, and it's only in John's gospel you find this. Amen, amen. I say to you, you will see the heaven open. So this is better than all the miracles Jesus did that I just listed off because he said, you're going to see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on. And here's another one of our titles where Jesus takes the, the messianic language from Daniel 7, 14 and applies it to himself. On the Son of Man. That's the only way Jesus referred to himself, and that, that title is only used by Jesus of himself. The Son of Man. What's he talking about? Did they ever see the sky ripped open? And did they ever literally see angels ascending up from Jesus and angels descending down? He's alluding to, of course, the dream that Jacob had, right? So I want to take you back to Genesis 28. Look at this. When Jacob was fleeing his brother Esau and he had to leave his mom and dad behind and go take a wife in the ancestral land of his fathers and he stops at this place that was called Luz out in, in, the, in the night in the middle of nowhere and he finds a rock and he uses it for his pillow and he lies down alone. And he dreamed. And now I've, three, three times I put the word italics I mean the word behold in italics. Look at this. This is a way the writer's trying to say, the writer's trying to get worked up and excited and say, look at this. So he says, and he dreamed a dream, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending, they were going up and, and descending on it. And behold, this is, a, this is a guy like a speaker really carrying on. And, and the Lord stood above it, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I'll give to you and your offspring, and I will multiply your offspring. They'll be like the dust of the earth. They'll, it, they will expand to the north and the south and the west and the east, he tells them. And then he says, and in you, and here's the promise God made to Abraham, and he says, it's going to come through you, in you. And your offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You and I, God came and made a promise to Jacob that night that you and I today will be blessed through him. Behold, and look at this comforting promise. I'm with you and I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I've done what I promised you. Now, how would you react? Wouldn't that be a a tremendous comfort. How does, how does Jacob react? Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And, and I didn't know it. He's out in the middle of nowhere. He didn't think his concept of God is probably very uh, pagan, very limited. And he's saying, well, the Lord's even out here. There's not a temple out here. There's not a house built for a God out here. There's nothing out here. And yet the Lord was here. He was present and I didn't even know it. And so you'd think, wow, he promised me he'll always be with me and he's, gonna, and he's not going to leave me and he's going to fulfill his word. Wow, how comforting. Thank you, Lord. No, what does he say? He was terrified. He was afraid and he said, how terrifying. Your Bible, older translations will say, how terrible is this place. He was shaking, no doubt. How awesome. Because God was present. 
He had a vision of God. And as you see over and over again in the Bible, it's not like the buddy Jesus or the cosmic counselor God that a lot of people have in mind. When people have an encounter with deity in Scripture, first they're terrified, then they're comforted. But he said, this is none other than the house of God. It's the very gate of heaven. And he called the name of that place Beit El. El is the, the, the word for God. It's the house of God, Bethel, Bethel. And so the ladder, Jacob's ladder, you see it depicted in artwork. I've been showing a lot of pictures of uh, Renaissance artwork, classic artwork, modern um, works of art. You see how persistent is that idea that angels have wings. But uh, notice how it's been depicted and how imaginatively uh, painters have portrayed it in different ways. That one's a little bit hard to see. I wish we had time to sort of look at those. But the point we're making is Jesus applies that to himself. They knew that's what Jesus was referring to, the dream of Jacob. And when you read that going through your Old Testament study, without any knowledge of the New Testament, it might just seem like a fascinating dream. But God was telling us something about what he was going to do to bridge the gap between us and himself. And Jesus said, that ladder, I am that ladder. I am the way to God. And people have portrayed that very imaginatively where we're separated from God because of our sin. And it, it, it's a crude image, the idea of a ladder that takes you up to heaven. We, we don't go up to heaven when we die as though we're, like, well, we've got to go up a ladder and then through a cloud and then we get to the other side of the cloud and we get a harp and some wings and we float around up there for all of e eternity. If that's heaven, I'm not sure I'm that interested in going. There, that isn't the Bible image of, of, of heaven. So it's a very crude image. It's the idea of a ladder takes you from this terrestrial, takes you from this earth up, up to another point. And so it connects something to a higher plane. And that's the idea. Jesus bridges the planes between, our, uh, between ourselves and God. And the reason he can is he is both God and man. He touches both shores. He can be the bridge across the chasm that leads to God because he both touches the divine side as God and the human side as man. He is the way to God, as the Hebrews writer says, and I'm just going to jump ahead here. He's the new and living way. He opened the way to heaven for us. But then finally this, and we're done. But what did Jacob see when he experienced that? Remember, Jesus is saying that vision, that I am the significance of that dream that Jacob had. Its ultimate meaning is in me. What did he say? The Lord is in this place. I didn't even know it. But the Lord is here, and, and I'm going to build a house when I come back to this place, and God's going to dwell here. Well, Jesus is the way that God is present with us. And Jesus is present with us through his spirit that he has put within us as his people. And so the church is the temple of God where the presence of Jesus Christ is. The presence of the Lord. You know, we live often with a profound sense of the absence of God, is the way one put it. We need to be constantly reminded of the presence of God with us and in us. Christ is present with you and with me. What did God tell him? I won't leave you, Jacob, and I will not forsake you, and I will do what I have promised to do. Jesus said, the meaning of all of that is found in me, in me. You know, we think that this was Bartholomew as we close. Uh, in the three of the four lists of the apostles, you have Philip and Bartholomew linked together. Philip and Bartholomew, three different times. Bartholomew means, Bar means son, like Simon, Bar Jonah means son of John. Bar Tholomew means son of Tholomaeus, and so we think this is Nathaniel, son of Tholomaeus. And there is a legend about, there is a church, let me just say it this way, a church tradition. I don't, forget that word legend, that wasn't the right word. There is a church tradition about Bartholomew that he was sent to the east, 
and to the Persians and in that part of the world to preach the gospel by the Lord. He's one of the 12 apostles. That was where he was sent and he was martyred there and he was martyred by being skinned alive. And it's hard to see in this image. I've brightened it up, but that man is sharpening a knife. And there are many other images that were far too graphic for me to show of paintings that have been made depicting the flaying alive of Nathaniel, the son of of Ptolemaeus for his faith for Christ. And in fact, here's a statue of him and he is holding his own skin. He's holding a knife and his own skin. And that's how he's typically presented in the way that he was martyred for the Lord. An Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. What a man to give his life for the Lord. As we said earlier, Jesus knows you. He knows all about you. He knows all about me. But do you know him? That's what we want to ask this morning. Do you know him? Do you know him in the sense, not just about him, but are you in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ? And dear brother or sister, you're a Christian, but would Jesus look at you and say, ah, you know what? There's Merrick, a Christian indeed, truly, can Jesus say that about us? I hope these thoughts will challenge us. And if we can help you, let us know. Come while we stand and while we sing together.